My name is Bayan Rice. I'm a third generation wine grower, and I've been making wine for over two decades here in Santa Barbara wine country. It's more than a job, it's a calling. Join me as I talk to my fellow winemakers in a series that is a candid conversation between winemakers discussing their wines, their craft, and their lives over two glasses of wine. So I'm two glasses in here with Andrew Murray. My name is Brian Rice. I'm the host for Two Glasses In, and one of your first vintages, I believe, was 1992. Same with us. But tell me about your journey personally, Andrew, how you got here, and why you ended up getting into the wine business. Yeah, it's it's a strange journey for sure. I mean, my it, it really began with the passion from my parents. My so my parents were in the restaurant business, and so people immediately assume like fine French dining or white tablecloth dining, but no, my parents had Mexican restaurants. They always said tequila paid for my- uh, <laughs> Margaritas. <laughs> yeah, margaritas and tequila is like what brought me up. And I'm sure it's true, but dad was a you know self-made guy, both mom and dad, and had a successful restaurant business in, in Southern California where I grew up, grew up in Long Beach. But my dad sold his business in 1988 and I was just uh, a yeah, sophomore in high school. He moved to Paris, like that was his dream. He just wanted to learn how to cook. And really where it happened was um, in this restaurant called L'Esperance, or L'Esperance. Famous chef Marc Minot, he was just getting his third star. It's in Burgundy. That's where I had my first sip of Condria. And this, this very snooty French sommelier, as you can imagine, came up to us and brought us in Burgundy, red Burgundy and white Burgundy. And he would say, oh, can you taste the cut hay? Can you taste the cranberry? And I'm like, dude, that tastes like red and white wine. <laughs> it was really innocuous. I didn't really care about it. My parents mm -hmm. were unimpressed. I'm sure they were really nice bottles of wine. I wish I could retaste those now, now that I know what I know. He brought us a Philippe Fauré Condria, and he said, you know, can you taste the pêche? Can you taste the stone fruit? You know, can you taste the white flower? And I'm like, I can. Huh. And so literally, I got into wine because some pompous French dude poured me a glass of wine that was a throwaway glass of wine and said, can you smell these you know, tropical notes in the wine? And I could. And so I thought I was onto something, literally. And we all looked at each other like, oh my God, I'm good at this. As only an 18 year old punk ass kid can do. <laughs> you know, it's like, or maybe I was but younger. That, I was that like was 16 like years old. A light time. bulb That was my moment. You. And so we and, actually name yeah. our, our red blends called Esperance to mm, this day. That's homage why. To that I always wondered. I, no, I'm really yeah, eager yeah. to taste your, your stuff. Uh, what cool. did you bring? I brought uh, two bottles today. I brought our 2017 Syrah Tous les Jours. Nice. Let's get started. All right. Should we open this one? Sure. Screw cap, huh? Screw cap. Oh, yeah. We started with screw caps. We were early adopters. I think it was back in 03 or something like that. It all started because of a wine dinner in Germany. There were many of us. I was probably the most junior winemaker there, but we had about 30% of the wines that night at Tantris, this famous restaurant in Munich that were all corked mm. and it just destroyed me. I mean, here, I, here I was, went all the way to Europe to sell our wine and wow. most of them were corked. So we literally came home and started exploring screw tops right after that. So. I don't blame you. This smells amazing. So this is a multi-site wine. So when I started the winery back in 1990, we, all of our wines were, you know, I think really affordable, but back then they were like 25 to 40 bucks. And I was just coming out of high school. None of my friends could afford our wines and they would just cry to me, you know, you need to make wine that's more affordable or, you know, we're going to keep drinking beer. And Tout les jours was born out of that. Tout les jours means every day. So, you know, this wine is varied from all over the valley. So back in the day, it started our, it was actually an estate wine, very small production. It's grown to about 13,000 cases a year. Wow. So Tout les jours is now about 25% estate grown and the balance, we have like a rule for Tout les jours. It all has to come from five miles of the winery's front door. Hmm. So it's labeled as San Inez Valley. Mm -hmm. So it's 100% San Inez Valley. We farm or direct the farming for 100% of the sites for this wine. Um, so we want it to taste like Syrah, but you know, nationally it's about a $19 bottle of wine. You can find it on sale at sometimes for like 14, 15 bucks. Oh wow, that's so a huge super, value. Yeah, super available, super accessible. And I find that a lot of the wines in this price point are over oaked with like wood mm -hmm. chips or you know, whatever, or they're sweet. Mm -hmm. We wanted this wine to be more of an aspirational Syrah, a really legitimate, you know, authentic Syrah. So it has the herbal spice notes that Syrah is famous for, those gamey notes but it's unmistakably California. It's fruity, it's bright, it's got natural acidity from our cool climate. And but do you also sell it in your tasting room? 
It's the one wine we don't sell in our tasting mm -hmm. room, so mm -hmm. you have to go and buy this somewhere else. Okay, so. all right. <clears throat> Very expressive of, as you said, the terroir of the central San Ynez Valley. Mm -hmm. Syrah seems to be a, a, a wine that hasn't really taken off <laughs> in our industry, but I know the you've been child. dedicated to yeah. it since the beginning. And how has Syrah morphed into something successful for you versus yeah. a lot of other wineries? The, you know, that terrible joke is, is what's the difference between Syrah and pneumonia? You, you can get rid of pneumonia. <laughs> um, it's not been true for us. You know, we... We looked at ourselves and said, you know, what do we know? What do, what do we like? Where should we go? And, and so we doubled down with Syrah. And that's when we started making more Syrah tout les jours. And it's basically, you know, not last year, but the years before that, it was almost doubling every year in production. So it's 13,000 cases now, but it was only got a couple thousand cases a few years ago. Wow, what a success story. Um, you know, we got a great score and changed distributors. and Right, and, you know. and Robert Parker really put Santa Barbara County on the map with his high, yeah, he, highly accoladed wines he, from, from you and Jim Clendenin and all of oh, yeah, these the cast of characters. Sure, yeah. But let me ask you a question, a personal question about scores. Okay, so we need scores to sell wine, obviously. It's a, it's a big factor, especially in the broad market. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've done very well with scores. I mean, it's, it's certainly allowed you to go into every market in the country and now internationally. But from a personal winemaker to winemaker perspective, how important is the scores for you to know if the wine is good or bad? Oh, irrelevant. <laughs> I don't want to overstate this, but as, as artists, you know, I think maybe, you know, I don't write books, I don't know how to paint, but there's nothing worse than sort of asking, begging someone to like judge you, you know? I mean, it's terrifying. There's no fun in that. And, you know, when they give you a great score, you always, say, oh yeah, they're the smartest people on the planet. And when they're not very nice to you, they're like, oh, they just didn't get it, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's prevalent in any world that where, you know, there's, a, there's sort of a bit of connoisseurship or consumership, you know? But I tell people, it's like, you say you can't sell Syrah, buy this one, I promise you, you'll sell it. And almost every time it, it sells. So, I think making it available, affordable, authentic helps a lot. So, we sort of did it the easy way and just made it affordable. Well, you've done a great job and thank you. You know, you're really a pioneer for this variety in Santa Barbara County and you stuck with it. That took a lot of courage, right? You know, a lot of wineries get nervous and they switch their programs and then they lose track of who they are. Uh, you've been committed to Syrah and you've helped develop Santa Barbara County as a Syrah producer and a, a Syrah region. I hope to live up to that, so thank you. Yeah, well keep it up, thank you. I, I really appreciate it, and this wine is astounding. Let's dive into this roasted slope, and yeah. I, I'd love to explain to people, if you don't mind, you know, what roasted slope means. I don't, I don't think people realize that there's this old world heritage around that phrase. Truth be told, when we started the winery, um, we only wanted to grow Viognier, and so it was actually a nursery mistake that brought us to Syrah in the first place. So we planted 1990, 93, we're getting ready to make our first Viognier and it all turns red. That is crazy, I so never knew that story. It's all Syrah. So you, this was a complete accident. Oh yeah, we make 95% Syrah. Syrah today and it all started with Viognier, so. That's the antithesis to the situation we had. We were planting Merlot and Syrah and we ended up with an accidental nursery mistake of Viognier. Is that right? Yeah, only one acre scattered throughout the entire vineyard. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. I didn't know that. And we offloaded all the vines, not knowing, of course, and putting them into mm -hmm. the ground. And then two years later with our first yield, we saw these beautiful golden, you know, sweet grapes right around August 15th. Got it. And next thing you know, DNA comes back as Viognier and we were in the Viognier business. So, so Roasted Slope is, is let me get there, is a 8% Viognier Syrah blend. So it's 92% Syrah, 8% Viognier by, and it's by whole cluster weight. Co-fermented we or yeah, are you blending? It is co-fermented. Yeah. So it's just like in Cote Roti, the same same methodology. They throw all the white clusters in with the red clusters in the, in the picking baskets. And So I realized I had this opportunity. We had this mishmash of a vineyard. So we created Roasted Slope and Cote Roti, which I think is the most astounding Syrah vineyard on the planet, not just visually, but just qualitatively, historically. I mean, there's Roman terraces, it's amazing. So we created the direct translation of Cote Roti, it means roasted slope. Oh, it's absolutely stunning. It's super powerful, but elegant. What, like, what would you take it out? What would you pair it with? What, what's kind of your favorite pairing with this wine? I don't know, any day that ends in Y. 
<laughs> it's uh, I, I like this one with, with like heavier fare. So like I love Saran games, so like lamb, duck. We've got a great local restaurant like SY Kitchen. They mm -hmm. do this polenta and like oso buco thing and it's like it would be they serve it there. So it'd be like really good with that is what I always think of. So like Man, we have to meat. go. Yeah, we should do that. We have to go do that. That sounds really good. <laughs> do that good. stat. So tell me, how can people find this wine? Unfortunately. They have to know you? No, no, it's not that. It's, uh, but they do basically have to get it from the winery or the winery's website. It's, I mean, I think maybe we sell 10 cases a year outside of the winery. So they have to come to your tasting room yes. to get it. And tell me about your tasting room. Where is it located? Yeah, we're, How do they find it? We're on you know, Fox and Canyon Road, on the Fox and Canyon Wine Trail, the heart of Los Olivos. Not hard to find. We're andrewmurrayvineyards.com. Mm. But the winery itself is a beautiful building. We only moved there or moved into that space. It's our third move, hopefully our last. We moved in there just three, now four years ago, and it's, a, it's the old Curtis Winery. It's, it's a beautiful, legendary. Yeah, it's a beautiful it's got space. A lot of history. Yeah, it was a Rhone varietal winery for the Firestone mm -hmm. family, so mm -hmm. it's like feels so cool to like to sort of continue yeah, that tradition. Absolutely, it's really an honor. But the the space itself is like it's it was a guy's private art collection or art gallery, and so it was never designed to be a winery. So when you flow through the space, it doesn't feel like it was ever going to be a winery. You know, we've got places where it feels like you're in there. You know, in a, in a in a living room, barrel room, and a tasting room. You know, there's always little private spaces, and I love it. Yeah, so it's do a beautiful I. space. Yeah, you have a beautiful space as well. So it's. Uh, oh, thank you. I come and steal ideas from you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the beauty of Santa Barbara County is we all share information and equipment and knowledge, and in some cases, marketing. We we co-market together yeah. and we help each other out where we can. And we've made wines together for that's charity. Right. You know? We've, we've, so we've, we've helped been, local schools yeah. together. And one of my favorite parts about Santa Barbara County and this wine country that we've been somewhat raised in is the characters, you know, the cast of characters, all the players, you know, from the pioneers like Kathy Joseph yeah. and Jim Clendenin to the rising stars, and Jill Russell would be good examples. They all have this sense of pride and, and uh, respect for our region. I think everyone feels enlisted in the Santa Barbara wine country story that it's, it is a special place. And it's, and it's got a camaraderie and a sense of uh, respect for each other as winemakers. I haven't really made wine anywhere else. You know, you're talking about young rising stars, McKenna Jardine. You know, she's going to, I've hired my replacement. You know, I'm, you know she's, she's on her way. She's already making our sister label, the 11 wines, but more forward searching than ever. It feels you know? like open source, right? Like we're, it, we're I feel like we're incubating mm -hmm. something now. You know, I mean, I remember when the Fess Parker did more than a few favors for me, but I remember like, I'm never going to be able to help them. You know, they're like big brother winery down the street, but they're like press broke one day and you know, three tons of grapes showed up and we were able to put it through my ghetto press that we had at the time. <laughs> and I remember like, oh man, I was finally able to pay it forward. You know, and I've been able to do it in spades since then, but this was a, like a lifetime ago. And so I feel like our industry in general, we all sort of want each other to do really, really well, I think. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most comfortable things about where we are in our place is, you know, I've traveled around. When I was at UC Davis, there was a guy named Jean-Louis Chav there. He was 14th generation wine grower. Wow. We're 47 years here in, in Santa Barbara County. Right. We're, we're laying a foundation that I hope will be like, you know, the Roman Empire of, of, of the future. You know, we're laying a foundation where people are going to be building on top of what we, we've done. And hopefully we'll all figure out a way to, you know, stay relevant and important and useful. But if nothing else, hopefully we've helped lay a cornerstone you know, that allowed mm -hmm what's coming next to, to be important. I'm excited to see where we go from here. But for now, I'm not slowing down. I'm 47 and I feel like I just got started. So hopefully, young man. hopefully I get to do this for, for a bunch more years. We so. get at least 50 more years out of you, right? <laughs> I hope so. That would be nice. This, this might help. It may not either, but it, uh, it might help. So. <laughs> well, I'll see you in 2070, my yes. friend. All right. <laughs> and all the years in between, I hope. So. Absolutely. Yeah.